Hello, everyone. It's Thursday, September 22nd. We'll talk about this further. Downside follow-through as the S&P continues to push below 3,800, uh, finishing the day around 3,760. We'll also look at sentiment. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hey everyone, welcome to the final bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at stockcharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down the activity in the markets using the power of technical analysis. The technical toolkit is designed to help us make sense of the markets and, it, and it's designed to do so by analyzing price, momentum, sentiment, trend, uh, all of those ways we can sort of get inside the head of other investors and understand what is motivating them, or or maybe it's more to the point how they're motivated to be adding positions, subtracting positions, risk on versus risk off, or continuing to get sort of a general risk off feel to things. Although one sector, healthcare, managed to squeak out a uh, positive day today. We'll look at a, a chart or two in that group for sure. I wanted to let you know what's coming up uh, on our show. We had a, two really good guests this week, and if you missed my conversation with Samantha LaDuke on Tuesday, or Sam Stovall yesterday on Wednesday, make sure you go review those. Next week, we have three solid guests. On Tuesday, the 27th, Mark Chaikin of Chaikin Analytics. Wednesday, the 28th, Mish Schneider of Market Gauge. And Thursday, the 29th, Greg Schnell of Osprey Strategic. All three of those guests, Mark Chaikin, Mish Schneider, Greg Schnell, will be participating in ChartCon. We actually caught up with uh, Mark Chaikin earlier today. Had a really cool discussion about uh, managing risk, about the volatility regime in 2022, about the presidential cycle, the calendar cycle, where he's finding opportunities, even in the weakness that we're seeing in the markets now. That's just one of the segments we'll be unveiling to you and sharing with you, most of them live from our Redmond studio coming up on October 7th and 8th. You can sign up at stockcharts.com slash chartcon. As a reminder, members get a deeply discounted rate, and you can also uh, join as a free trial member and you can get all the benefits of membership, including a cheap and inexpensive but incredibly valuable uh, way to get to uh, participate in our ChartCon events. So don't miss out. Let's continue on today's show with our market recap. Let's talk about what's actually happened today. You know, yesterday on the show, we talked about the choppy uh, sort of quiet period going into the Fed meeting. A quick 1% to 2% swings both ways uh, as the uh, initial announcement was made as Powell started his press conference. By the end of the trading day, the markets had pushed uh, pushed lower. The S&P closing below 3,800. Now, 3,900 is the level we talked about for quite some time. We touched there briefly yesterday afternoon before reverting lower. Today, sort of further downside. There was a bit of a rally in the uh, late afternoon, sort of 3, 2.30, 3 o'clock-ish uh, period, where we also man almost managed to get into, uh, into the positive. The Dow briefly did actually go positive, but at the end, the S&P settling back down in the last uh, 10, 15 minutes. Finishing the day down 0.9% to 3760, just a bit below there. NASDAQ composite down uh, a lot more around 1.4%. Mid caps and small caps both down over 2%. That's notable uh, with the uh, some of the higher beta, generally speaking, higher risk names down the most. The VIX actually off today. So if you think about the VIX and the S&P as being just a very simplistic inverse relationship, over time, that has tended to be the case, but not necessarily on one particular session. So the VIX actually pushing down a little bit by 0.6 to 27.40. Let's look elsewhere. A big story today, I would say, would be the rise in rates. Ten-year yields right around 370. That is a long way from where we were not too long ago. Earlier this year, previous years, we were talking about you know sub-1% yields and just talking about the environment and the potential upside. Talk about a continued reversal. Obviously, the Fed communicating their um, uh, their expectations to continue to raise rates to address inflation, certainly being reflected in the yield curve, with the long end of the cur curve in particular uh, moving to the upside. 370 is a new high uh, for the year, uh, certainly on a closing basis. Bond prices obviously down, and that's one of the really interesting discussions I've had with a number of people uh, recently. Um, 
Uh, I know with Sam Stovall, it came up. Certainly, we were talking about rates uh, with Mark Chaikin earlier today. We were talking about the bond markets and how it's a great leading indicator. Uh, Samantha LeDuc mentioned it. Martin Pring, if you're a Stock Charts member, make sure you don't miss Martin's most recent article. You have to be a member to access it. It is one of the many things I would, reasons why I think you should consider having a premium membership because he did a great job of explaining that relationship between bonds, stocks, and commodities. Now, it's a, it's a simplification of a, a what can at times be a complex or, and fluid relationship. But overall, if you look over multiple cycles, multiple regimes, multiple years, it's tended to play out in this way. And, and the general thinking is, until you see an improvement in the bond markets, it's unrealistic to expect a meaningful recovery for stocks. So today, for what it's worth, continuing to what we saw yesterday, uh, further downside for bonds, upside for yields. And certainly, there could be much further upside for yields, uh, for sure. Commodities are pretty choppy, actually, and net almost a wash, right? Gold and silver right around where we uh, ended the day yesterday. So no real particular message there, I would argue. Cryptocurrencies, a ton of green. And talk about an interesting uh, relationship where uh, stocks, one of the you know classic risk assets, uh, you know, faltering and uh, and netting out to a negative move. At the same time, you have Bitcoin up almost 5%, back above 19,000. Ether prices up almost 7%. Uh, over uh, over thirteen thirty, uh, so all ten of the top coins that we track all up uh, in the uh, in the green today. So a bit of a diversion uh, with a uh, with a different risk asset, cryptocurrencies uh, rallying quite nicely today. Let's review a chart of the day of the S and P five hundred uh, on a daily basis. Let's see what today means relative to the longer term trend. So you know, again, technical analysis one hundred and one, really trend following one hundred and one. This was Charles Dow over a hundred years ago explaining what a trend is, right? What does it mean for the markets to trend? And he focused in on swing highs and swing lows, right? Are the lows getting lower? Are the highs getting higher? You can make that basic assessment on a chart. You have a good sense of what's going on. So my question looking at this chart, are the highs and lows getting higher or lower? And certainly since mid-August, the answer has been lower, right? We've seen a, a consistent trend of lower lows. When we've rallied, we'd failed to eclipse the previous swing highs. That is a chart very much in a downtrend. Most recently, we broke below 3,900 key level, as we've talked about, uh, I feel like exhaustively on the show. We're now continuing to push to the downside. So at, earlier in the day, actually, it almost looked like this may end up being a hammer candle kind of day because we were rallying uh, in the uh, in the afternoon. But by the end of the day, right back toward the lows of the day, just continuing to follow on from yesterday's uh, yesterday's sell-off. So now that we're below uh, the key Fibonacci level of around 38.15, 38.20, what's next? So two levels I would I would argue are, are more important, are most important going forward. Number one, the low from June, right? And I think at this point you could consider where we're right now, where we're at right now, to be a retest of the June lows, whether or not we literally get to the penny to that low. I think more psychologically, we are now retesting the low from June, right? We are at Around within a rounding era of that low uh, of that low day, uh, we're very close to where most of the closes were in this cluster of closes here in June and early July. So right now we're essentially retesting the lows. The question is, do you see buyers coming in and buying on this recent uh, recent weakness? So what what it, the reason why what happens day to day is important is because the buying that would come in, the new buying, the money being put to work should be reflected on the intraday movement in stocks, right? If people start buying, we're not gonna see down days closing near the lows of the day. We're gonna see accumulation and more bullish constructive candle patterns. You didn't get that today. And that's what I'd be looking for until you get that sort of indication, sort of uh, you know, uh, confirming that there's a bit of a rotation in the short term, there's no real chance for, uh, for a pivot in the long term. That's what most candle patterns are designed to capture, particularly the reversal patterns like hammer candles and doji candles and engulfing patterns and all those. They're meant to capture when the short-term sentiment shifts. We're certainly not seeing that uh, yet today. Looking back at the uh, at the dashboard for the day, and we do have a couple segments today that are going to be uh, interesting to do. We have a segment on breadth and a, a segment on sentiment because uh, a big move in the AAII survey that I want to share with you. So we'll go through some of those in a little more deal, so, detail. So in the recap today, I just want to start or continue on looking at some of the data points today. What did we learn? So we learned one sector was actually positive. And I would tell you, that's an interesting message. It's interesting to look at when it feels like nothing's working, when it feels like everything's going lower, where do you see green, right? Where do you see sort of these moves to the upside? So just for one day, a microcosm of this larger trend, healthcare 
up on the day. Consumer staples essentially flat for the day, a little bit negative, and utilities about a third of a percent lower. On the downside, consumer discretionary financials, industrials down uh, all over one and a half percent, and uh, consumer discretionary leading the way lower, down 2.3 percent. So let's focus on what actually worked today. Pharmaceuticals, you look at the Dow Pharmaceutical Group up over 2 percent. Non-ferrous metals uh, within uh, energy, you have oil and equipment and services, mobile telecoms up a third of a percent. And these are not like rips to the upside, but it's worth noting that when everything is sorted down, where were you seeing some assets rotate? Pharmaceuticals is actually a really interesting one uh, at the uh, at the top of the list here. If we have time later, we may go through a chart or two of those. But looking at the uh, the list, Eli Lilly, the best performing out of the S&P 500, uh, Merck, uh, BM Weiber, still Myers, you have Vertex, uh, let's see, Abvi, Johnson & Johnson. I mean, seven of the top 10 on my quick glance are all in the, maybe six out of 10 are in the are in the healthcare sector, most of those pharmaceutical names. So certainly an outlier relative to the broader market going down. I also want to remind you this predefined alerts tablet or uh, widget. I love having this on there because at a glance, you can see all the signals. Green is bullish, red is bearish. Look at this consistent number of bearish sort of triggers of whatever it is and look through the details, of course, and look through the charts, but just sort of tells you the uh, general trend. Just to finish off our market recap right now, Half of the Menomina stocks actually finished in the green. That is an interesting data point uh, to take away besides the strength in healthcare as you're debriefing on today's action. Let's take a quick break. We'll be back. Banking on Brett. See you in a minute. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. We appreciate so much you joining us every weekday after the close for our show. A couple quick announcements before we get to our next segment. First off, we welcome your questions. Big part of this show is the mailbag segment runs twice a week. We did a great one on Tuesday. We'll do another one tomorrow on Friday show. We love to feature one of your questions live on the air. Our email is thefinalbar at StockCharts.com. We are on Twitter at Final Bar SCTV, and we're on YouTube. Just put a comment below the video you're watching on our Stock Charts YouTube channel. We'll gather all those questions. Hope to answer one of yours live on the air in our next mailbag. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. We have so much great content every trading day. I was uh, exchanging emails with Larry Williams yesterday, recently put out his most recent uh, market outlook. He's done such a great job through the course of 2022, sharing um, some specials on our uh, on our, uh, on our our channel uh, to help just inform and educate of the lessons he's learning real time during the year 2022. All of that is available on much, much more at StockChartsTV.com or on your mobile device. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. Let's continue on our show today with our next segment, Banking on Breadth. What we like to do is check in on breadth indicators. Breadth, as, uh, as I've, uh, I've mentioned many times, I, I, I really think of breadth as participation. You look at what the major indexes are doing, whatever broad benchmark you want to look at, the S&P or the NASDAQ or the, the Russell or whatever global benchmark you might be uh, following. Breadth indicators let you look sort of that next level down. <clears throat> the market itself, however you would define it, is doing one thing. Obviously, most recently, most most uh, equity markets have been trending to the downside in some way. Uh, but then breadth measures tell you what are the individual stocks that comprise those indexes. What are those actually doing? And a lot of times, signals and reversals will be uh, will be uh, communicated or will be reflected in the breadth data before it's reflected in the major averages for a number of reasons, which we can maybe get to in a special down the road. Having said that, let's look at some of the measures of market breadth and what they're telling us about the market conditions here right now as we uh, enter into the last week in September. Looking at cumulative advanced decline lines here. So the S&P on a closing basis is at the top. These four orange lines are the advanced decline lines for four different baskets of stocks, four different broad baskets here. We have the New York Stock Exchange, the uh, S&P large cap, S&P mid caps, S&P small caps. And you're literally looking at how many stocks closed higher or lower on any given day, and then uh, taking those values and tracking them over time as an accumulative measure. So uh, um, so over time, you get a, a sense of the trend 
of advancers and declines. So if you think about what I just described in terms of the simple map that comprises these indicators, it's an equal weighted measure. And that's important because the S&P, most of our major averages, besides the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the transports, most averages we follow are cap weighted, meaning the largest companies have an outsized impact on the performance of the benchmark. The advanced decline lines and most breadth indicators, to be honest with you, are more equal weighted because it's looking at a group of stocks and trying to make a binary assessment who's uh, how many of them are fulfilling a particular observation. So as a result, it's a great way to look at the broader participation. Do you, do you see similar patterns in the individual stocks as opposed to just the broad uh, indexes? In this case, we clearly have the S&P coming off the uh, August test of the 200-day moving average, getting very, very near on a closing basis. Uh, the low we had in June, which is just below 3,700, less than 100 points from where we're at today. <clears throat> if we look at the advanced decline lines, you can see a couple observations. Number one, all four of them uh, broke to a new high, broke above their June high, a new swing high uh, in, uh, in the month of August as the market was showing strength. All four of them broke back below that level before the month of August was done. All four of them have now tested and completed a rotation down through their own 50-day moving averages. And now all four of them are getting very, very close to their previous lows from June or July. Now, you had an interesting pattern back here in June and July where you had a divergence where two of them made a lower low going into July. The other two made a higher low. And that was an interesting, a lot of times you'll have a disagreement from the different cap tiers that uh, often coincides with a uh, with a significant turning point, certainly indicated strength going uh, out of July into August. We don't see anything of that sort yet, right? Uh, of course, these trends are still active, so we don't know how, where exactly this downtrend that we're in, in the, at the moment may end, but I'm keenly aware of where they are at relative to the June or July lows, and they're getting very, very close. It could be a really important chart to watch to see if you do, in fact, uh, undercut there. When we talk about breadth, I immediately think about stocks above moving averages. Uh, Sam Stovall on the show yesterday had a really interesting chart I had not looked at before, um, looking at the percent of sub industry. So looking at the you know lowest level of the S&P's uh, tiered system of breaking down sectors and industries, what percent of the S&P 1500 industry groups that were above uh, key moving averages. Here we're looking at the S&P 500 themselves, looking at the 500 stocks, are they above or below their 200 day moving average? Four out of five S&P members as of today's close, are above, uh, or sorry, four out of five are below their 200 day. Only one in five are actually remaining above their 200 day moving average. That's not that's not great, that's, that's pretty low. 50 day moving average, it's even worse. We went from 92% in mid August of uh, S&P members above their 50 day moving average. Now it's to 12, so literally 80%, four out of every five S&P members were above their 50 day back in August are now below their 50 day uh, here in September. When we talk about a swing, when we talk about elevated volatility in the rotation from strength in early August to weakness in late September, I think this is one of the greatest charts to show you that. Now, that's coming off of single digits back here in June, and that's where the indicator can certainly go. If you look back at the low in 2020, even go back further to 2007 into 2008 and 2009, when you've had a more protracted bear market phases, these indicators can both, in fact, go to zero. And the 50-day in one in particular often remains at or near zero for quite some time. It, 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 at the longest time, I think up to six months, it remained down in that uh, in the single digits. So just because it's gone down a lot doesn't mean it's over, but it does tell you to start to look for uh, signs of concern. Just to finish off our segment on breadth, I did want to highlight this one. This is the NASDAQ 100 bullish percent index. I think it's really interesting to look at point and figure charts. Um, we don't get to share them as much as I'd like on the show, but at some point we will uh, we will incorporate a little bit, a uh, little bit more. Uh, but with point and figure charts, it's a simple way of uh, tracking trends. And this tells you how many of the 100 stocks in the NASDAQ 100 are in a bullish point and figure signal. And right now it's almost down to 10%, very, very low number that still remain in a bullish phase. Getting below 30% is a key bearish trigger because you can see just going back through 2022, getting below 30% is usually not the end of a downtrend. That's usually the middle or sort of the uh, the initiation of further downside. The S&P the, uh, has made a new uh, low. The Nasdaq Composites made a new low for the year. Every time we've seen that pattern, we've seen that pattern again uh, executed this week. So that may suggest the Nasdaq and certainly uh, a related the S&P could be going to new lows for the year. That's our segment, Banking on Breath. Let's continue on, uh, talk about sentiment. It's really fun today. We're getting to uh, break down the market on three uh, levels, like what I like to do in my own process, starting with price, 
then going into breadth, and then going into sentiment. Let's talk about some of the sentiment indicators and what they're telling us. And we usually review these every Thursday, so I'm glad we're bringing them up today because a couple really interesting developments. Number one is a chart of the VIX, right? And we talk about volatility, the theme of ChartCon 2022 coming up in just two weeks from tomorrow. Um, the theme is all about volatility. It's all about surviving uh, the, these markets in uncertain times and dealing with elevated volatility. When you look at the chart of the VIX, you can see why 2022 has certainly felt like a choppier, more distracting, more confusing type of year, more unsettling year. Because look at what the VIX was doing in mid-2021, sort of between 15 and 20 to 25 here, we're going 20s at the low end, and on the upper end, 30, 35. The VIX getting above 30 has coincided with all the major bottoms so far going back in 2022. We are not there yet. The VIX is not even touching 30 yet. We're still sort of in the upper 20s. Uh, what's really interesting to me is we got a, a question. I don't know if it was from the mailbag. It might have been on our YouTube channel, but I did see a question when I was reviewing them uh, first thing this morning. Uh, someone asked, can the market bottom with the VIX not above 30? <clears throat> and I, I, I'm sure it was a is a very innocent question, which was just literally, you know, could we bottom today? And, and what does that mean if the VIX not, is not to 30? But the fact that someone is asking that question is what concerns me, right? If we're so looking for a bottom that we're like, hold, it, it, it almost it, it, it felt desperate to me, right? Can the market somehow bottom before we, you know, do we have to not? somehow not have to wait until the VIX to get above 30, because that certainly implies further downside. And my argument would be probably not. I mean, if you look at what's happened in 2022, bottoms have been marked by elevated volatility above the averages that we've seen. We're still sort of in the middle of the range of where the VIX has been in 2022. So is it theoretically possible? Of course it is, right? The market could rip to the upside tomorrow on some crazy announcement that I can't predict, and volatility will come off and the markets will, will rally. And that, that could certainly happen. It's highly unlikely. And what's a much more likely scenario is that we consider continue to see price deterioration it, until the point at, at or such time when the VIX gets above 30. That's when you can start to think about the bottoming process on that tactical uh, tactical time frame. So I would argue the VIX is telling you, even with the sell-off that we've had, the volatility has not been extreme enough to indicate capitulation. And that is a key word to be looking for. VIX is telling you it's not there yet. Now, Another angle to that whole capitulation thing is when uh, when um, uh, sentiment gets completely bombed out. And that was one of the really interesting uh, tells that we've seen uh, at many uh, market sell-offs, deep, deep sell-offs in market history. You'll get to what's called a, uh, a sentiment capitulation, where it feels like there's literally no one left, right? The last thing you can imagine doing is buying a share of a stock on the exchange, right? When we get to that point, when people are so avoidant because they just can't imagine stocks going higher, as Walter Diemer ran the technical team at Putnam in the 1970s would say, when the time comes to buy, you won't want to. And that is arguably what I don't think we've seen yet. I'm still I'm still seeing people that are looking for opportunities that are optimistic uh, at these levels. And, and again, I, I'm more excited when I don't hear that sort of chatter as much as I do now. Now, another way besides just anecdotally thinking of social media and whether there's more of a bullish or bearish uh, feel to things, we can look at survey data. And we're looking at the AAII survey data today, over 60% bears. Now that, if you look back at the deep history of the AAII survey, and again, the, the AAII survey, the American Association of Individual Investors, this survey is not perfect. It is 100% not perfect. And I, and I would love to suggest to you it's this amazing, you know, crystal ball, holy grail kind of thing that has picked every major turning point. Absolutely not. I mean, and, and, and I don't think of survey data as ever having the possibility of being that precise or that important in a process. I do think it's really interesting because what it does is it helps you think about what the message you're seeing from price and breadth, what those actually mean. What I'm seeing right now on this uh, on this weekly survey with over 60% bears, which is incredibly rare, uh, tells you that sentiment has gotten incredibly negative. We've gotten down to these levels twice before in 2022. One of them, pretty major bottom here in June. This is when the S&P was testing its 150-week moving average. It really got down, I think, to the 200-week, if I remember right. The other time earlier this year was in April of 2022, which was nowhere near the bottom, right? That actually happened here sort of in the beginning of this downtrend. So if you look at, think about that previous chart when we were talking about breadth, about the um, the NASDAQ uh, bullish percent index getting below 30%. Now that doesn't mean 
we're necessarily at a bottom. That means just the downtrend is very much in force. That's about the same time when you had bombed out sentiment in April. So what we're seeing right now from my read looks a lot less like June, like we're going into a capitulation low. It looks more like April, which is like, this could be just the beginning, right? This is the beginning of a of more of an acceptance phase where people recognize the market's going down and we could go much further. It's worth noting, by the way, if you look left on this chart, what I like to do, and this is a trick I learned from, shout out to Jeff Todd, who ran the Fidelity chart room for years before I was a part of the team and then continued to be one of our analysts when I was, uh, when I was on the staff there. He always would put horizontal lines from the current data point going left, a horizontal line, just a very vis important visual cue to show where we're at relative to where we've been. And just look at the daylight between this purple horizontal line and the sentiment readings we had in March 2020, in December 20, uh, 2018, even the first quarter of 2018, when we had that first sort of initial drop. In all of those cases, the bearish sentiment didn't get anywhere near the level of extreme that we've seen. So when you talk about extreme volatility, extreme uncertainty, extreme skepticism of the fact that equities are going to do okay, the AAII survey is, is telling you that very much. Just look at the sentiment in 2021 versus how all of these histograms have gone down. The spread between the two is over 40%, which is also very, very negative. Here's the problem. When you have protracted recessionary bear markets, think back to like 2008, 2009, the sentiment can get this negative and just stay this negative for an extended period of time. And that's why I'm not telling you the AAII surveys, 60% bears, this is a time to, to buy because I can't necessarily say that, because if this is more of a deeper and protracted bear market, this could be just the beginning. We need to finish today's show, folks. Although it's been a lot of fun looking at these charts, let's wrap it up looking at the three and three. We like to hit on three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. And here we go. Chart number one is the S&P 500 and two breadth indicators. We actually didn't get to these in our breadth segment, but when I was talking with Mark Chaikin, he shared a chart, which we will share with you Live at uh, Charcon, I'll show you the chart that he actually shared, which is one of his key charts to use to pay attention to these uh, to these markets. When I'm looking at uh, two of those indicators, it's the McClellan Summation Index and the McClellan Oscillator. Again, these were two of the five or six that Mark shared on his sort of go-to chart to navigate 2022, particularly through the end of this year. Both the McClellan Summation Index, uh, which is uh, the first panel below the price, and the McClellan Oscillator, which is more of a uh, you know a, a mean reversion indicator telling you strength and weakness. Both of them very clearly breaking down through the zero level. The McClellan oscillator did it back in uh, in uh, mid August, uh, which was really as the S and P's rallying higher. You saw the McClellan oscillator rolled down. It was a really great uh, suggestion that that rally might uh, fizzle out. The summation index in a clear downtrend as well. Both of them below key moving averages that I use to track the trends, and both of them below the zero level. If you want to find what to look for to get excited about a more meaningful recovery, one thing that is most likely needs to be a part of it is both these indicators getting back above the zero line. And we're not seeing that anywhere near uh, those levels today. Chart number two is the AAII survey. Uh, we mentioned this in our segment on sentiment. I'm bringing in a lot more data here for the three and three to show you a bit of a deeper history back here. It's so fascinating when people ask me why technical analysis is important. I tell you, it is the ultimate history lesson for the markets. If you want to understand what the market does around inflationary periods or rising interest rates or an accommodative Fed or a um, restrictive Fed or anything else, any sort of other question, charts can tell you what happened. And while it can't necessarily tell you exactly what's going to happen, you can learn a lot from the lessons of market history. We're now at a 60% bearish rating. That's happened a couple of times in 2022. The last time it happened before then was back at the 2009 low. We even didn't even get down that low in 2002 or in 2000, 2001. We have those initial sell-offs during the tech bubble popping. But here's the challenge. Look in early 2008, which was the first time we saw a 60% negative reading. Look at how many times we bounced off of that level while the downtrend was still intact. Finally, pharmaceutical stocks doing just fine. Like no issues are out there. Eli Lilly is one I wanted to highlight. Bouncing off of support around 295, potentially breaking above trend line support, uh, trend line resistance. I look for a break above 320. That would make it a new swing high. Could stocks and groups like this work in a down tape? Absolutely. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. I want to thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close of all of our previous discussions at StockChartsTV.com. I'm Dave Keller. Have a great night. 
Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment, and if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.